Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about a suppressor screen. And I'm going to just quick go over what that is, why you would do that, and why we do it the way that we do it. So why would you do it? The goal of a suppressor screen is you have some phenotype. Okay. Phenotypes are what you're using to measure some something in science, right? You, if you can't see it or you can't measure it, then you can't do science. So phenotypes are essential in the suppressor screen. And the suppressor screen implies that you have some kind of a phenotype and you want to kind of know how it happens. So oftentimes in yeast, this would be a phenotype like cell death induced by some maybe mutation, or this could be like uh, cell division is disrupted. These would be easiest things, or you could have like a visual phenotype. And the idea between the idea of a suppressor screen is that you look for genes under certain conditions that suppress that phenotype. So you try to find other genes that suppress the particular phenotype, and then you kind of know that there's like a genetic link between X and Y because there's a relationship that suppresses these phenotypes. So that's kind of the basis. And so the idea is, can we find pathways or targets. Um, in my case, we did a suppressor screen with SIDB, which is a CI-inducing enzyme, and we wanted to know what substrates is it targeting. So we did a suppressor screen and we found this gene SRP1, which is a karyophoran uh, that involves is involved in nuclear nuclear import. So then we were able to kind of conclude that because overexpression of SRP1 inhibits SIDB toxicity, that CI might be induced by altering nuclear import. So that's like an example of why a suppressor screen would be useful, why you might want to use it. If you have a complete unknown, a complete protein that you have no idea what it does or what it interacts with, a suppressor screen is a good place to start to try to find and define the functional purpose of a gene. Okay, so that's why you would do it. So let's talk about how you would do it. And most of the time, at least in my lab, what we're gonna be using is yeast. The reason we use yeast is it's because it's a model you carry out and it's fast, it's quick, it replicates very quickly. And there's all kinds of tremendous genetic resources with this model you carry out. So one of these resources is the tiling to Micron library. And that's what we're gonna use in the suppressor screen. So in yeast, there's 16 chromosomes. So just imagine 16 chromosomes. And what somebody did is they digested, they purified genomic DNA from these 16 chromosomes, and they used restriction enzymes to cut them all up in little pieces, okay? And then each of these little pieces they individually cloned into a plasmid that's held in bacteria. So this is a, has a canamycin resistance cassette. It's called PGP564. We'll talk more about the vector later. But basically they're able to clone regions of the yeast genome into these various library plasmids. And for each of these plasmids, there's a corresponding E. coli strain that holds the plasmid in what we call a library. And each of these E. coli, the way that the library actually looks is it's put into a 96 well plate. And each, in each of these wells, they take the E. coli strain and they make a glycerol stock in each of these wells. So if you ever wanna draw out a specific plasmid from the library, these are labeled a, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever, down one to nine. And you find, say, let's say the clone is B2. You go to B2 and you can poke that little thing with a toothpick and then you could inoculate some media and to grow up that clone, which might hold the specific plasma that you want. 
So that's the way that the library is specifically constructed. And these inserts that cover the yeast genome are tiled. So that means that the inserts overlap in a region. So you know you cover the full yeast genome. So somebody spent a long time making and sequencing every one of these plasmids. Um, and there's 17 library plates, each with 96 wells. And each of these sections has multiple yeast ORFs on it. So the premise of the suppressor screen is you got some plasmid with your gene X that induces phenotype. Okay, and then you add in all these different plasmids at the same time, and you can select for, if your phenotype kills, anything that survives, if it has a suppressor, this clone would, in theory, this if this is a yeast cell, budding yeast, uh, and it's got plasmid, this one, the toxin plasmid that induces some phenotype, and it's got a suppressor plasmid. This thing will actually grow up on a plate. You'll see a colony, you can pick that colony, and then you can extract the plasma, you can find out what this is, okay? So that's how a suppressor screen works. Okay, so this suppressor screen that we work with, this tiling library is, these. this identifies dosage suppressors. So this it's essentially overexpression Overexpression. So essentially, the suppression mechanism is overexpression. And the way that you do this is in the library, the plasmid PGP564, the backbone that has each of these inserts, this is a two micron plasmid. That means the origin of replication in yeast is two micron. And the two micron plasmids are high copy up to. Uh, I guess it's up to about 60 copies. So essentially what you're doing is you're saying, here's yeast, they have a plasmid, phenotype kills them, kills. But if they have 60 copies of gene X and that suppresses, then you know that there's a genetic link between gene X and this phenotype. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the premise of this study. Um, okay, so tips and tricks, why we do it the way that we do it, very, very specific details. We use, um, you have to make, since you have to have, the study involves two plasmids in the same cell. And one of the things you worry about when you put two plasmids in the same cell is competition between the plasmids, because the plasmids are selfish genetic elements this one wants to replicate, and this one also wants to replicate. So sometimes they compete with each other for the replication machinery. So you worry about that, that that could disrupt the ability of your screen to work. So we use two different plasmids when we do this. The way that we usually do this is we have a plasmid called PRS416 GAL1. This should be capitals, I guess. GAL1. And this is a this one means it's a SEN plasmid. So that means the origin on this plasmid that we use is a centromeric plasmid. That means it has one to three copies per cell. So this is a low copy plasmid. And in our case, what we did in the last publication that we submitted in, in Dylan's work, we put a gene from a bacteria that killed yeast. We wanted to know its phenotype or its pathways, its targets. So we put that gene in this low copy plasmid. And the reason we made it low copy is because sometimes suppressors are very, very weak, okay? And to detect them, you want kind of, if, if imagine, imagine, let's say you imagine protein X, and this is increasing concentration of protein X. And here you get no phenotype, and with this concentration, you get cell death. And anything more than this is just kind of like overkill. Does that make sense? So what you want to do is, if possible, in the scenario of a suppressor screen, you want to express your 
phenot induce your phenotype kind of like right at the threshold so that you can push and pull things, so you can suppress things just beyond that point. So imagine if you were overexpressing to this point and suppressor, it still might suppress, but you wouldn't ever detect it if it could only suppress this much. Does that make sense? So you kind of want to titrate your toxin or whatever your phenotype is just to the bare minimum of the threshold so that you can detect very, very weak suppressors. That's the ideal scenario. So that's why we put our genes that we're studying in PRS416 GAL1, which is the send low copy. Okay. And that's why we also have the suppressors in the high copy to micron, because you kind of want as much of the suppressor as possible to detect it. And so that's why this is a dosage suppression system where you have suppressors in the high copy and the inducer of the phenotype in the low copy. So that's just a little on that. And you could also tweak with fiddle with different promoters. GAL1 is quite strong promoter. So you could also fiddle with not only the plasmid origins, but the promoter. And I should also say that the SEN and the 2 micron don't compete. So it solves our issue of competition. It'd be harder to do a suppressor screen with two 2 micron plasmids because multiple 2 micron plasmids compete with each other. Okay. Um, So let's just go into the detail to talk about these plasmids. Also, okay, let me pose a question. If you have a cell, a yeast cell, that is suppressed, so it grows, and it's got the toxin plasmid, and it's got the suppressor plasmid, how do you purify just this one? Because we have to get into a scenario where we have to identify what this plasmid is. And one of the problems is we might also get a bunch of this plasmid. So how do we purify for just this one? Any ideas? That would be a good way to do it. Yeah, and that's pretty much kind of how we do it. Um, so what we do is these plasmids, you we want you have to pull them out of yeast and put them back in E. coli. So these plasmids are special plasmids that have both yeast and E. coli markers. And in the yeast, so this is let's label this PRS four one six gal one, and this is PGP five six four. In yeast, the selection for this is Lu leucine. In this one, it's Ura three uracil. And in PGP564, it's canamycin for bacteria. And in PRS416 GAL1, it's AMP. So all you need to do is do a genomic prep, um, which is called smash and grab from the yeast. So you purify the plasmids from the yeast, and you're going to have a mixture of both. But then when you plate, you transform them by electroporation into E. coli. And then you play it, and which media are you going to choose to select for a suppressor plasmid? Yeah, you're going to choose canamycin. So you just make media plates with canamycin, and canamycin will kill all the bacteria that just have this one, and they'll select for ones that just have this. Okay, so we played on canamycin, and then we do a mini prep, and then we sing your sequence. And if this is PGP564, we have a primer here and a primer here. And in theory, this could vary. This is the variable that we're detecting. We sequence Singer sequence into that insert, and then we can detect by the sequence and then blast which library plasma was the precise suppressor. Does that make sense? Now, just to be clear, that's not the end. And this is actually a massive workload because here's the problem now is once you get a suppressor, you're not done because that suppressor has many ORFs from the tiling library. So it could have ORF 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And you have no idea whether or not your suppressor is conveyed by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or a mixture. Does that make sense? So then you have to go through the long process of subcloning. So you subclone 1, 
subclone two to N, and then you test each of these individually to verify which is the suppressor. And then you can confirm if you have a plasma that just has one, that that ORF is in fact the suppressor that you pulled out. Does that make sense? So usually, uh, I'll just quick say this, usually when we detect and verify the suppressors, we'll do this by serial dilution, which you all know is a measure of growth in yeast. So we can detect if this is what serial dilutions usually look like. If say this, this lane right here was toxin, it'd be dead. And then if this one had a suppressor, it would grow. And we could conclude that if this had plasmid one and the toxin, that it was suppressing. So that's the end. That's what we're going to do. Any questions?